nanohub.org. Okay, so let's get on to more interesting things. The model 4210 CVU instrument module. This is Keithley's AC impedance module. Now, this module, this, this section of the uh, seminar assumes that you actually have seen yesterday's session and that you understand the basics of how to create a test, how to create a project, how to manage tests in the kite interface. We're not going to cover that again. So let's start with a CVU measurement overview. The CVU is a multi-frequency AC impedance meter operating from 10 kilohertz to 10 megahertz. It measures the impedance by sourcing an AC voltage and measuring the AC current across the device. We have one AC voltage range, 100 millivolt range, but we allow multiple AC voltages. You can program the AC voltage. We have three AC current ranges, and I'll explain to you what the AC current range means to a capacitance measurement. The time domain of the AC current and voltage needs to be processed into the frequency domain so that we can produce the phasor form of the measurement. The capacitance and conductance that we're measuring is extracted from the phasor form of the measurement. It is, has the ability to not only apply the AC signal, which is normally a small signal, but also a DC signal. And that DC signal can be plus or minus 30 volts. However, it's available at both terminals of the CV meter, giving it 60 volt differential capability. So this is a simplified block diagram of, a, of the CV instrument. The CV instrument has four terminals on it, and we name them after a traditional AC impedance or LCR meter. They have the high terminals, which are called the high current and the high potential terminals, and the low current and low potential terminals. Now, using the terminology that we introduced yesterday for the source measure unit, this would be high force and high sense, and this would be low force and low sense, okay? But we stuck with the traditional LCR terminology on this, thinking that people would, would understand it better. And it works like this. The high source or high current terminal has a programmable DC source, plus or minus 30 volts, with a programmable AC source riding on top of it. That supplies a signal through a coaxial cable to the device under test. The current flows through the device under test and comes back in the low current terminal, or the low source terminal. There's an AC ammeter in that terminal measuring the current. Now, simultaneously, our sense terminals, high pot and low pot, are digitizing the voltage using a Kelvin connection across the sample. And we've got an AC voltmeter doing that. So what we're really doing is we're digitizing the current and the voltage on the sample simultaneously. Now we phase lock these digitizers to a very tight reference. So we know with seven digits of accuracy what the phase is between the voltage and the current. We know the amplitude of the voltage, we know the amplitude of the current, we know the phase, we can extract the, uh, the phaser form of the impedance. Now, yeah, there's a question. Can we go back to the previous slide? Yes. Um, why do we have to connect out the conductors on the coax? Say again, please. We have to connect the outer conductors of the coax together. Okay. The question is, why does the outer conductor of the coax need to be connected together? And that, that's an excellent question and it's very important because the signal path actually comes down the center conductor through the ammeter and the ammeter is referenced to the, what we have here labeled as a common terminal. That common terminal is the outer conductor. The signal actually has to return all the way down the outer conductor. In other words, for this coax cable to act like a transmission line, transmission line theory says I have to actually have the signal going in both directions. That's what balances the line and that's what gives me the transmission line effect. If I don't connect these cables, this signal has to return back to the AC source through whatever path it can find. That 
That's an unpredictable path. That path could go all the way through the power line of the instrument and come back somewhere else. And that puts that signal in a huge inductive loop. And an inductive loop is actually giving us nothing but a large 180 degree out of phase error with the capacitance that we're trying to measure. So what we're really trying to do is minimize the inductive loop around the entire measurement circuit. Now, the higher you go in frequency, the more important this becomes. So traditionally at 100 kilohertz, the connecting these shields together is less important. But at a megahertz, this is quite important. And since this AC impedance meter actually goes to 10 megahertz, this becomes even more important. Now, most Multi-frequency AC impedance meters use what's called the auto balance bridge method. And so I wanted to take just a minute and describe what an auto balance bridge is. So this is a drawing of our AC impedance meter, but in a different form. Here is our high terminal, just call it the high pot and high current, both here, right? We just have one. And so we're sourcing our DC bias and our AC signal and we're measuring our voltage and supplying that to our device under test. The current comes out of our device under test back into our low terminal and actually comes to a null detector. This null detector says what I really, my objective is to make the voltage that is appearing right here go to zero. So what we have to have is we have to have a, a current sense element here. And between the current sense element and, and the, uh, the cables and everything, we develop a very small voltage right here. But we want to know that. We want this to be at virtual ground, and it's an AC virtual ground. So we do that with an active null detector, which detects the voltage, feeds it back to a DC source here. That DC source sends a balancing signal back to here, forcing this point to be at AC zero volts. So this auto balancing of this bridge forces a zero volts right here. Now that will become important when, uh, when uh, I start to show you some models of how we connect this instrument to a probe station. And you'll see that by forcing virtual ground here, um, we actually improve the integrity of the measurement significantly. Now in the Keithley AC impedance meter, this is a digital loop. In other words, we're digitizing this voltage, digitally processing it, processing it, and digitally generating a counter signal. So this auto balance bridge nulling operation takes hundreds of microseconds. We can null that down in hundreds of microseconds down to picovolts. Now, as a user, you really don't need to know anything about the fact that we have an auto balance bridge here and how, how it works. But I wanted to explain that it's here because the way that you load this terminal or connect it to the sample can impact how an auto balance bridge works. <clears throat> so let's talk briefly about basic AC parameters. Now, we all learned this in AC Electronics 101, but for many of us, particularly me, that was 30 years ago, and for some of us it was 10 years ago, and we may not remember, so this is a quick refresher course. <clears throat> AC impedance is usually described in one of multiple AC impedance planes. This is called the admittance plane, all right? And so what we describe here is we describe a resistance vector, which is at the zero degree vector, and we described a reactance vector, which is at a 90 degree vector. <clears throat> so the current through a resistor is in phase with the voltage, but the current through a capacitor or an inductor is 90 degrees out of phase. So the way that we mathematically describe that phase difference between the two is what we're talking about here when we talk about the impedance plane, right? So, <clears throat> If we apply voltage and measure current, that 
vector would lie on the real plane. And if it had any capacitance, that vector would lie on the imaginary plane. If it had inductance, that vector would go the opposite direction of the capacitance. The resultant vector is a combination of the two vectors, and we call that amplitude z with phase angle theta. So that gives us our z theta, that is a combination of both vectors. So what we're measuring actually in this instrument is we're measuring z and theta directly. Anything that, that comes out of that other than z and theta is actually a calculated parameter. We measure the amplitude of voltage and current, which gives us the amplitude of z, and we measure the phase angle between them. All right? So that's called impedance and phase angle, and that's the uh, uh, polar form of that. Mathematically, we can convert that to the rectangular form. That's the real element plus the J operator and the uh, imaginary element, the X element, resistance and reactance. Now, from these, we can actually extract our more common models, which is the parallel resistance capacitance model, which is actually usually capacitance and what's called conductance, and the series capacitance and resistance. So now we actually have multiple planes that we can describe these, these elements in. And these multiple planes really are just terminology and they were originally developed to simplify the mathematics before there was pocket calculators, okay? So uh, we have the admittance plane, we have the susceptance plane, we have the impedance plane, and so we we wind up with a lot of terms like admittance, acceptance, conductance, capacitance, uh, reactance. Um, all of these terms really are just mathematically related. They're just a mathematical way of, of creating an alternate form of this impedance that we can deal with mathematically back in the days when we had to deal with it by hand. Okay. So here's some of the formulas that, uh, that we use. The um, amplitude of impedance is, of course, um, R squared plus X squared, the square root, okay? Um, of course, the impedance is the resultant of R plus JX. If I want to get the phase angle, I can take the arc tangent of X over R. R is equal to the co Z times the cosine of theta, or X is Z times the sine of theta, okay? If I wanted to calculate admittance, admittance by definition is one over impedance, and admittance is normally defined as G plus JB, where G is what we call the conductance, and J is the imaginary operator, and B is we, what we call susceptance, okay? And of course, dissipation factor is actually the ratio of the resistance to the capacitive reactance. So dissipation factor is actually unitless because of the, both of those are in units of ohms. Dissipation factor just relates to us how much loss is in the element, how much is a resistive element which has loss versus a reactive element which has no loss. Dissipation factor is very important and we define it here because dissipation factor defines the goodness of our measurement. Imagine this. Imagine I'm measuring a pure capacitor, so my vector, my z vector lays right on this x axis here, this x line, right? So there might be just a small amount of leakage in that capacitor. So this r vector would be very short, right? Well, because the r vector is very short and because I measure the composite, the z, that means the r vector is susceptible to noise and inaccuracy. Okay. Well, turn that around. What if I'm measuring one of the modern, extremely leaky gate dielectrics? That gate dielectric actually has probably more resistive leakage, depending on the DC voltage, than it has capacitance. So now I've got an R vector, which is very long, and a very short capacitance vector. This is the problem, we call it the high D problem. This is why we have so much trouble accurately measuring capacitance on a leaky gate dielectric. So <clears throat> we see, what we see is we see um, dissipation factors in the range of 10 or 50. 
That means that the resistance vector is 50 times larger than the capacitance vector. Or, another way to look at it, my signal to noise ratio on my capacitance measurement has been reduced by 50. Okay. So that's why we have a problem trying to measure capacitance on a leaky uh, gate. Now, the only way that we know that is if we look at both capacitance and reactance. So tip number one for you, when you're measuring semiconductor capacitances, always take a look at the conductance, or if you're in the series model, the series resistance. That will give you a very good indication of the goodness of your measurement. If you've got a large conductance, you need to understand what's going on there and how it's impacting your measurement. So one of the ways that we deal with this in semiconductor devices is we change the frequency. So the capacitive reactance is uh, yields an impedance which is frequency dependent. But the resistance or the real element is not frequency dependent. So I can change the length of this vector that my measurement instrument sees by increasing the frequency for the parallel model. In other words, if I increase the frequency, this becomes a lower impedance, more current or a longer vector, and this becomes a shorter vector, hence my capacitance measurement should get better. Right? Now, the opposite is true if my device is actually a series model. In a series model, I want to lower the frequency, which increases this impedance uh, and gives me more signal across my uh, capacitor, less signal across my resistor, hence making my capacitance measurement better. So you frequently will see uh, a terminology or training that says if you have a high D device, increase the frequency and you'll get a better capacitance measurement. Well, that's not true. D is defined by which model you're using. If your device is really a series model, you have to lower the frequency to get a better capacitance measurement on that. Now, the Keithley uh, AC impedance meter in the 4200 will automatically cal calculate for you any of these parameters. Of course, you could go in and manually enter any of these equations, but we built that into you in the models of, uh, of the system. So when the Keithley AC impedance meter takes its data, puts it into our spreadsheet tool, in our definition tab, you define what model you want if you go into the definition tab and change the model, the sheet tool will automatically update to reflect the new elements. Now, the 4200 AC impedance meter is actually called a CV meter. That means it was, it was designed specifically to measure capacitance and conductance. However, it really is a Z theta meter. So that means it actually can measure inductance quite well. Now, inductance will show up if you measure an inductor, but you have the meter set up as a capacitance meter, it shows up as negative capacitance. Okay. So whenever you see negative capacitance in one of your results, that means that you have some inductance in your measurement path, which is dominating the capacitance that you're trying to measure. All right. Now, so if you wanted to actually use the Keithley AC impedance meter to measure inductance, we recommend that you set it to a Z theta mode, and then you can easily calculate the inductance from basic formulas. You can do this actually in the formulator. So it actually is a very nice inductance meter. Now, we're frequently asked with the Keithley AC impedance meter, what is the maximum capacitance that we can measure? Now, remember that the 4200 characterization system was designed as a semiconductor characterization system. In general, it measures small things, but sometimes we want to know the maximum capacitance. And so what we've created is um, a special sort of advanced tab that you can access from the definition menu that gives you a capacitance range estimator. And we created this for this particular reason. If you look at an LCR meter or an LCZ meter, 
It defines its accuracy and its ranges as impedance ranges. How much impedance am I measuring? But if you look at a CV meter, such as the Keithley, the traditional 590 CV analyzer, we define the ranges in capacitance ranges. So if you're interested in measuring the capacitance of your gate or the capacitance, the parasitic capacitance of your device, you're thinking in terms of capacitance. I'm, I'm going to have a picofarad or 10 picofarads. You're not thinking in terms of impedance. Now, if you're used to it, you can quickly do a mathematical conversion in your head from capacitance to impedance, but most people, their head is not wrapped around that. So we actually created a capacitance range estimator, and it works like this. It basically says, what test frequency have you programmed, programmed in to use? What current range are you using to detect the current that's coming out of that capacitor? And how much AC voltage are you going to apply to that? Knowing the current range, the frequency, and the AC voltage, I can estimate the maximum capacitance that you'll be able to measure. Well, the other thing about the maximum capacitance is that's really telling you the capacitance range. Now, this is roughly a six-digit measurement, depending on speed. Could be seven digits, could be five digits. So if I've got settings that give me a 159 millifarad range, and I have six digits, that takes me down here to a 1.001 millifarad, or a one microfarad digit. So with these particular settings, my least significant digit, also known as the resolution of the measurement, would be one microfarad. So if I was trying to use these settings to measure a 100 picofarad capacitor, that's well below the noise of what this range is. So this is your sort of your range estimator. It tells you another measure of the goodness of what your measurement would be. So if you're measuring a really big capacitor, you want to go to the lowest frequencies, the highest current ranges, and the lowest AC uh, drive voltage. And so you'll see here, this range estimator is actually saying Keithley could measure 159 millifarads. I think if you build a, a capacitor all the way the, across the top of a 300 millimeter wafer, you still wouldn't get 159 millifarads. That's a really big capacitor, okay? Yeah. Suppose during the experiment, uh, suppose uh, I'm ramping the temperature. So, if sometimes happens that the capacitance become very high, and what I need to do with this instrument? So, I have to change the range, or because okay. so I'm only changing the temperature and measuring the rest. So, the question to repeat the question: the question is, I have a situation where I'm ramping temperature, and the ramping of the temperature causes the capacitance to change radically maybe even change by, could be an order of magnitude or more. Do I need to manually go in and change the range? And the answer is no. Uh, if you actually look right here, this is where we actually control the range of the capacitance meter. So you actually have three ranges you can select, or you can select auto range. So if you select auto range, the capacitance meter will automatically go in and attempt to determine which current measurement range um, it will select. Good question. Yeah. Uh, yesterday, when we talked about auto ranging, there yeah. was a, uh, an issue of uh, a glitch when the range shifts because of the change in resistance of the yeah. uh, op-amp. Do we have something similar here, or will the range adjustment be smooth? So the, uh, to repeat the question, when we describe the, the uh, ranging of current measurement on a DC source measuring unit yesterday, we talked about how new ranges require a new settling time. And in some instances, that settling time may not be met and that shows up as a discontinuity in your data, often called a glitch in the data, right? Now, this instrument has the same issue. Whenever you change the current sense element, 
the new sense element has a new RC time constant. Now we try to build into firmware the capability to wait and let that get settled to the appropriate level. The, the, the level that matches the accuracy of the instrument. On the other hand, we don't want to let it settle forever, so we don't want to give it infinite settling time. So when the instrument changes range, it will throw some extra settling time in there. And yes, there are instances when that may show a discontinuity in your capacitance or your impedance measurement. If that's the case, then we give you some tools to be able to go in and change that, to be able to go in and control that. That's a very good question because frequently we'll see a small discontinuity in a, in a capacitance due to a range change. And, you know, people think that it, it's either a problem with their device or that the instrument is putting a voltage glitch on the device, perhaps damaging the device. You know, neither one of them is true. It's really just a settling time issue in the current ammeter, whether it's DC or AC impedance. Uh, the other reason that it shows up is that, and this is where we usually see it, our graph is auto-scaling. And so if your capacitance is sitting relatively flat and stable, maybe changing just slightly, and it happens to be right at a range boundary, the graph will have magnified that such that you might, the graph might be scaled at 10 parts per million, and I, we may have the settling of the AC ammeter tuned to uh, 200 parts per million. So when, when it changes range, it puts a 50 part per million discontinuity on there, but the graph is scaled at 10 parts per million. That looks like a huge discontinuity. So you always need to look very carefully at the scale of the graph to make sure that what you're seeing is something that you really need to be worried about. So we uh, sometimes we work with switches where capacitance is supposed to change at a stimulus. Right. Uh, when we have the, the the boundary of a range in display <coughs> measurement, so we know that this glitch is related to a shift in range, or uh, or is it my device acting properly? Is there some way to know that immediately, or do we have to go back off screen and check over here? Um. So to repeat the question, in case the mic didn't pick it up, um, the question is, if we see a discontinuity in a measurement, uh, is there a way that we can easily tell that it's at a range boundary, or is it our device? In the case of the example you gave, you have a device which you expect to have a discontinuity in, in capacitance. Um, there's not an easy way to tell that, and, and I'll tell you why. Because the ranges, which are set in discrete steps of a milliamp, 30 microamp, and one microamp ranges, right? All depend on how much current is flowing, but the amount of current flowing, it depended on your frequency and your AC drive level. So not knowing frequency and AC drive level in advance, I have no way to predict where the range change is in advance. So what I normally suggest is to choose a fixed range. I normally say don't use an auto range, and here's the reason why. This AC impedance instrument actually has six or seven digits, depending on how you have it configured. Certainly it has five digits, even in fast mode, right? That's five orders of magnitude, or six orders of magnitude of sensitivity that it has. There's very few devices that will change their capacitance over six orders of magnitude. So if I just choose the proper range that I know can handle the highest capacitance, odds are I still get a great measurement with four or five digits of resolution even when it changes down to the lowest range. That's one of the advantages of using a very precision instrument is we really don't have to change range in order to uh, to give you a good measurement across five orders of magnitude. Normally, I suggest use fixed range, okay? That's not necessarily true with a DC um, precision SMU. 
With a DC precision SMU, I might test a, trans, a transistor that moves across nine orders of magnitude across its operating range, and so I have to change range with that. But in general, AC impedance doesn't move that far. Now, this is, I'm glad you brought that up because this is something we see time and time again in the industry, particularly with people that use a standard LCZ or LCR meter to make their measurements. LCZ, LCR meters always auto range. And, and to get them to go to a fixed range, you have to dive several menus deep and most people don't know how to do it. Most of the time, any software written to drive those instruments don't take that into account. So you frequently will see range discontinuities when you see a traditional LCZ or LCR meter taking data. But I'm glad you brought that up because this is a very important screen for controlling the range. It's one menu deep. It's called the advanced capabilities. And um, <clears throat> it gives you a lot of power in controlling how your uh, AC impedance measurement is made. Now, the other question that we get is, what is the smallest capacitance that we can measure? Now, this question is probably more relevant to us in the semiconductor industry than the biggest capacitance, right? So the minimum capacitance, it's kind of a difficult question to answer because there's so many variables in an AC impedance. Things like what are your drive voltages, your frequencies, your parasitics in your test system? Are you going through a switch matrix? <clears throat> but but let's try and give you some examples of what you could possibly measure. For example, if we chose a one megahertz test frequency, by the way, on this particular instrument, one megahertz is a sweet spot. This instrument works really, really good at one megahertz. Contrast that to a traditional LCR meter, they're really bad at a megahertz. So megahertz here, you know, uh, there, there's sort of a perception for people that have used traditional LCRs that a megahertz, you know, uh, doesn't work well. That's not the case with this instrument. It's, it's really a sweet spot. It measures very well. At a megahertz with a 30 millivolt drive, a 30 millivolt drive is a very common drive level for uh, making measurements on a semiconductor. The reason is it's roughly in the neighborhood of one thermal voltage on a junction on a semiconductor. And that means that we're residing in what's called the small signal regime. In other words, this AC drive level is really not modulating our semiconductor device. Now that hold, held true for many, many years in silicon and silicon dioxide. But with a lot of the new materials, the thermal voltage um, you know, may be different. We may have to reduce this voltage in order to keep it in the small signal regime. But if we chose 30 millivolt and we were trying to measure a one picofarad capacitor and we went and deconvolved Keithley specification, which is actually really easy to deconvolve, we have a 0.38% absolute accuracy on this measurement. That means if you had a perfect one picofarad capacitor, we would measure something between 1.0038 and 0 0.9962 picofarads. Now this is an absolute accuracy number. That means this number is traceable to national standards. All right. That's not the noise. It's not the sensitivity. It's not the resolution. It's absolute accuracy to a national standard. The noise sensitivity and resolution is actually many orders of magnitude better than this. Okay. But what this tells you is I could measure a one picofarad capacitor pretty darn accurately. I know it pretty well. So here's an example of us making a measurement on a half a picofarad, roughly a 500 femtofarad capacitor. Right? And what we did is we first made this measurement. Uh, actually, it's a megahertz, 100 millivolt on a 30 microamp fixed range with a hold time of one and a delay of zero. Okay. So what we did is we ran this measurement using the quiet setting. Remember that the AC and PINS meter in here is like an SMU. It has fast, normal, and quiet settings. So we ran this on the quiet setting. And this was the result on the quiet setting. Now, I can't tell you how many times I get phone calls saying, my result is noisy even when I run it on quiet. Well, here is a perfect example of what you need to define what noise is. Look at the scale here, if you can see it. This scale is actually 0.1 
femtofarad per division. It's 100 attofarads per division on a 500 femtofarad capacitor. In other words, the peak-to-peak -peak noise here is actually 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. 0 0.3 attofarads. That's a third of a femtofarad. That's really not very much noise. <clears throat> okay. But notice the time. We took multiple samples here at a fixed level, sampling AC impedance versus time. And so this total curve took under five seconds. So we said, well, you know, 0.1 attofarad is, you know, that's pretty good noise, but we want to get it better. What can I do to make it better? So we went to the custom time mode. In our custom time mode, we give you very detailed control of, of how to control how long the AC impedance meter looks at the signal, which means we can reduce the noise or increase the number of digits that we display. So we went to a custom time node mode of 10 power line cycles. To remind you, in the US, a power line cycle is 16.6 .6 milliseconds, 16.7 rounded. And so 10 power line cycles would be 166 milliseconds. And we went to a filter factor of three. To remind you of yesterday's training, filter factor is a noise reduction factor. So basically we said we want you to increase the integration time to reduce the noise by a factor of three. And so the result of that measurement is this blue line. You see it's significantly slower. In fact, this entire sweep took 45 seconds to take. Okay, There's an awful lot of data points in there, but it's significantly slower. But here's the real upshot. The standard deviation of this measurement on a 500 femtofarad capacitor is 20 attofarads. Now just to remind you what an atto is, because some people uh, may not remember. Atto is 1 times 10 to the minus 18th. Okay? So, the fundamental charge on an electron is 6.9 times 10 to the minus 19th. If you round it up, that's 1 times 10 to the minus 18th. Okay? So, you know, there's about 10 electrons. If we put 10 electrons uh, on there, that would be, um, actually 20, would be 20 um, atto coulombs of charge on there. Or 20 atto, atto coulombs of charge would make a, a volt on this kind of thing. Okay. So this is pretty, this is really tiny. 20 atto farads is good. Now, it's probably not the lowest capacitance that any commercial instrument can measure in the world, but it's probably pretty darn close. And it certainly is the smallest capacitance that a, a full characterization system can measure.